Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chapter One Read Aloud. Today, I'm actually going to be reading an excerpt from a book I talked about in the last episode, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is the next Hunger Game book coming out May 19th. I know we still have technically another month before it comes out, but I wanted to give you this sneak preview. Now, for those of you who know nothing about Suzanne Collins' first three novels, The Hunger Games Trilogy, it follows a character named Katniss Everdeen. However, this story is actually a prequel, a book that comes before the original three, and it's about President Snow or Coriolanus Snow. So he is from the original Hunger Games trilogy. In fact, in that trilogy, he's a little bit of a villain. That's because they're all about Katniss and he's against Katniss. Again, he's perceived as this tyrant, this terrible villain. But in this particular book, there was, we find out a little bit more to him, right? More than maybe we knew. What if it could be, crazy it may sound, that Coriolana Snow was a hero? Now, for those of you who've never read the books, this doesn't mean anything to you, but I highly recommend that you read all three books before this prequel comes out. But for those of you who are avid fans of the Hunger Games trilogy, in your head, I'm sure you're wondering, how could President Snow in any way be a hero? Well, let's find out. Here is an excerpt from The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. The grand staircase up to the academy could not hold the entire student body, so it easily accommodated the stream of officials, professors, and students headed for the Reaping Day festivities. Coriolanus climbed us slowly, attempting a casual dignity in case he caught anyone's eye. People knew him, or at least they had known his parents and grandparents, and there was a certain standard expected of snow. This year, beginning this very day, he was hoping to achieve personal recognition as well. Mentoring in the Hunger Games was his final project before graduating from the Academy in midsummer. If he gave an impressive performance as a mentor with his outstanding academic record, Coriolanus should be awarded a monetary prize substantial enough to cover his tuition at the university. There would be 24 tributes, one boy and one girl from each of the 12 defeated districts drawn by lottery to be thrown into an arena to fight to the death in the Hunger Games. It was all laid out in the Treaty of Treason that had ended the dark days of the district's rebellion, one of the many punishments borne by the rebels. As in the past, the tributes will be dumped into the Capitol Arena, a now dilapidated amphitheater that had been used for sports and entertainment events before the war, along with some weapons to murder one another. Viewing was encouraged to, in the Capitol, but a lot of people avoided it. How to make it more engaging was the challenge. With this in mind, for the first time, the tributes were being assigned mentors. 24 of the Academy's best and brightest seniors who had been tapped for the job. The specifics of what this entailed were still being worked out. There was talk of preparing each tribute for a personal interview, maybe some grooming for the cameras. Everyone agreed that if the Hunger Games were to continue, they needed to evolve into a more meaningful experience, and the pairing of the Capital Youth with the district tributes had people intrigued. Coriolanus made his way through an entry draped in black banners down a vaulted passage and into the cavernous Heavensby Hall, where they would watch the broadcast of the reaping ceremony. He was by no means late, but the hall was already humming with faculty and students and a number of games officials who were not required for the opening day's broadcast. Avox is wove through the crowd with trays of Pasca, a concoction of watery wine laced with honey and herbs. It was an intoxicating version of the sour stuff they had sustained capital through the war supposedly fending off illness. Coriolanus took a goblet and swished a little of the Pasca around in his mouth, hopefully rinsing away any trace of cabbage breath. But he only allowed himself one swallow. It was stronger than most people thought, and in previous years, he had seen upperclassmen make a complete fool of themselves by Im imbibing too deeply. The world still thought Coriolanus rich, but his only real currency was charm, which he spread liberally as he made his way through the crowd, Faces lit up as he gave friendly hellos to students and teachers alike, asking about family members, dropping compliments here and there. Your lecture on district retaliation haunts me. Love the bangs. How did your mother's back surgery go? Well, tell her she's my hero. Dean Casca Highbottom, the, main credited, the man credited with the creation of the Hunger Games, was overseeing the mentor program personally. He presented himself to the students with all the verve of a sleepwalker, dreamy-eyed, and, as usual, doped up on morphine. His once fine physique and shrunk, was shrunken and draped with sagging skin. The close-clipped precision of a recent haircut and crisp suit only threw his deterioration into relief. Due to his fame as the game's inventor, he still had a tenuous hold on the position. But there were rumors that the Academy Board was losing patience. 
Oh, there, he slurred, waving a crumpled piece of paper over his head. Reading the things off now? The students hushed, trying hard to hear him above the din of the hall. Read you a name, then you who gets that one, right? So fine. District one boy goes to... Dean Highbottom squinted at the paper, trying hard to focus. Glasses, he mumbled. Forget them. Everyone stared as the glasses already perched on his nose and waited as his fingers found them. Ah, here we go. Livia Cardew. Livia's position, pointed little face, broke into a grin, and she punched the air in victory, shouting, yes, in her shrill voice. She'd always been prone to gloating, as if the plum assignment was solely a reflection on her and not on her mother running the largest bank in the capital. Coriolanus felt increasing desperation as Dean Highbottom stumbled through the list, assigning each district's boy and girl a mentor. After 10 years, a pattern had emerged. The better fed, more capital-friendly districts of one and two produced more victors, with the fishing and farming tributes from four and 11 also being contenders. Coriolanus had hoped for either one or a two, but neither was assigned to him, which was more insulting when Plinth scored the district two boy. District four passed without mention of his name, and his last real chance for a victor, the District 11 boy, was assigned to Clemencia Dovecote, daughter of the energetic secretary. Unlike Livia, Clemencia received the news of her good fortune with tact, pushing her sheet of raven hair over her shoulder as she studiously made note of her tribute in her binder. Something was amiss when a snow, who also happened to be one of the Academy's high honor students, had gone unrecognized. Coriolanus was beginning to think they had forgotten him. Perhaps they were giving him some special position when, to his horror, he heard, he heard Dean Highbottom mumble, at last but least, District 12 girl, she belongs to Coriolanus Snow. Mm, do we feel bad for Coriolanus yet? So once again, I hope that you have enjoyed that chapter one read aloud. And I hope like you, I cannot wait until the new book comes out on May 19th. Thanks for watching.